Hey, it's the premiere episode of How I Got This Gig. Today on the show, my video twin, Berman Lamb, shares his story of how he got his start in this business and how he became a creative director. And what the heck is a creative director? All right, let's do it. Hey, welcome to the show. It's the first episode of How I Got This Gig. It's a podcast that I decided to create after I've just been asked so many times by young people and probably more often young people's parents as to how do I get into the media industry? How do I get into television? How do I get into making videos? Hey, I want to I want to be a filmmaker. And you know, there just isn't a clear path of how to get a career in this industry you know it's not like being a teacher you don't go to college then teachers college and then be a substitute and then take on supply teaching or maybe that is substitute teaching uh, and then get a job and then you're set for life no it's not quite like that there are probably a thousand and one ways to get into this industry and people come into the industry from all walks of life people come in as young people people come in as old people it's it's pretty unique in that sense, but it can be very daunting if it is something that you are considering getting into. So what I thought I would do is start a podcast to talk with industry professionals to find out how they got into this industry and to share their experiences and some advice for you. Man, all the different jobs that are there, you know, from writers to directors to producers to technical people and grips and executive producer and also sort of shine a light too on some of these roles and and what is involved in them because it's all very fluid in the film and television world and you know I've heard a lot of people out there saying you know the end is near for media now it's not no people will always be creating content and people will always be watching content and we just got to figure out how to how to monetize it and stabilize that. That's going through the ringer a little bit. But other than that, you know, people want to watch stuff. And there's always going to be that need. So I'm going to be sitting down with all the industry folk that I know, and I'm going to get them to share their stories and their experiences of of breaking in and working in this media industry. And I'm hoping that you can get some real value from their stories, from their experience, and from the advice that they share. So that A... You can find out if you really want to be in this industry. B, you can figure out how to break into this industry. And most importantly, C, you can understand what it takes to persevere in this industry. Does that sound okay? All right. Hey, How I Got This Gig is brought to you by The Video Twins, videotwins.com, which is an online resource that helps people make better videos. Whether you're a hobbyist having fun or you want to go pro, VideoTwins.com is filled with tips, tricks, and hacks to help you up the quality of your video productions. So check out VideoTwins.com for free resources and tools. And, you know, I'm one of the guys behind VideoTwins.com, and the other guy, my twin, is Berman Lamb. And I have known Berman for a very long time. I think I've known Berman like 15, 16 years, maybe longer. Um, We both had entry-level film television jobs together we quickly went our separate ways and then we worked we kind of came back together again like 10 years later and worked together you'll hear all about that in this interview Berman's got uh, a really unique look at things he's uh, got an economics degree and a film studies degree and he talks about how he parlayed that into a career in the television industry and what I think you're really going to enjoy here is he talks about three really kind of important things throughout this his story arc of his of his career so far and that is you know dealing with office politics when you work in a corporate environment for a broadcaster and he talks about managing a creative team you know how is that different and and what are some tips of dealing with that and he we also discuss kind of from both sides here, being a jack of all trades and a master of none versus, you know, specializing in something. So I really hope you enjoy this. Berman's got some great experience. He comes from uh, television commercials mixed with a television broadcast 
background. And so uh, I had a lot of fun with this interview. So uh, let's get to it. Okay. Yeah. Got your coffee? Got my coffee. Nespresso? Nespresso. Nespresso. So, okay, let's get started. Let's just dive right into it. What the hell is a creative director? A douchebag that sits in the corner office and plays video games. And that's why their screen usually not facing anybody else but himself. Right. Or they have that protector on that that you can't see what I'm looking at. Yeah, but they could see you. They're perverts, really. <sighs> um, pervert. Well, at least I was. Yeah, you can get away with it because you were, you were in Asia, right? How many years were you in Asia? I was in Asia for, including my stint in Singapore, I was in Asia for about eight, nine years. Yeah, yeah that's almost a, a decade. Time. Yeah, That was a wow. long time, yeah. So you haven't always been a creative director. I, let's start, what is a creative director? Is there a definition of it as a job title? It's funny you should ask because there is, but the definition doesn't really match what people usually do out there. So a creative director is a person who leads a team of creatives uh, their sole purpose really is to, is to help people below them, below them that work for them, uh, get the best out of their own creative minds and stuff like that. So they give direction, they provide direction, they provide nurturing for the team and everything. And, uh, yeah, everything that comes out of that team should have their fingerprint on it. Well, okay. Interesting that you say this and we're going to go, we're kind of starting at the end and then we're going to go back to the beginning and then come back to the end. But because yeah, I, I think that what you've just said is that as a creative director, you're kind of a mentor, you're kind of a leader, you're kind of a teacher, which means that you kind of have to have a certain type of personality maybe or something and not... Because I've had creative directors that weren't really mentors and teachers. But. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And the majority, to be honest with you, the majority of creative directors out there do not actually do the job as per the definition. A lot of them are still there with the mentality of like, you know, I'm the top dog. Everything should be like my creative, my idea and stuff like that. Like they're the star. Um, a lot of people don't realize that creative director really that is still a director level, which means you're in management. Oh, okay. And a lot of people forget that part. And it is a struggle because a lot of creative people that come up, that's not their mentality. They're not groomed to be people who manage other people. They're right. groomed to just, or at least their goal in life, their aspiration in life, if you're a producer or a director or anything, is create, uh, create creative work, right? So once you hit that level of creative director, people have this idea that, oh, it's, it's now I get to, I'm, I'm on center stage. I get to show off my stuff. But that's not the case. Right. Reality is you have to, it's a bit of both. And that's the huge struggle that most creative directors, whether they know or not know, have. Okay. So it's the meeting of the creative aspect meets the management aspect so it's kind of a corporate title then because okay you know we're, we're going through all kinds of jobs in the media with this podcast right everything you know i mean the next person i'm going to interview is a music video director so that's director in a totally different absolutely context yeah right yeah so i mean yeah you're absolutely right this uh creative director this title is given from a corporation or a company right it's not like a director where you can just step out and go oh i'm a director of film Right. Right. There's no company or you're, you're a one off person. You're a freelancer, essentially. But when it comes to a company that has like I worked for Fox, I worked for National Geographic. And for them, a creative director role is in that director uh, category. So it is management first. Right. So if you look at those companies, uh, film companies or, or like a t television company, a creative director is the one director level person that's unique compared to all the other directors in that company. Right. What kind of companies would you see creative directors in? You mentioned uh, broadcasters, yep. like TV channels. TV channels. Uh, you would have like even radio radio stations, something radio like that. Stations. Um, advertising agencies. Advertising agencies have creative directors. Um, those would be slightly different because there's they're much smaller. Yeah. And uh, you you may not have as many. I mean, depending. Some I mean, some hey, of Sachi and Sachi are huge, right? Totally, Leo Burnett. Yeah. So I take that back, but. The boutique ones, well, a creative director is still just the lead, the creative, lead creative guy. But when it comes to Leo Burnett, Sachi and Sachi and stuff like that, those people sh theoretically should be management. Right. Yeah. And okay. So, all right. So let's go back to the beginning here. How the heck did you get that gig? Like, did you always know that you wanted to work in film and television? No, I, I didn't know what I wanted to do. I still don't really know what I want to do. I think that's the reality of today's generation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, it, like in high school, what, what were you what were you planning to do? In high school, survive. You know, really? Yeah, just try to get. New, I mean, 
I came from a family where, you know, uh, immigrant family, you know, parents are from Hong Kong and everything. They didn't have much of an education. They just worked their ass off at a restaurant. Uh, and they didn't like that lifestyle. So all they wanted for their kids, wanted, wanted for me is to get an education so that I won't be able, I won't need to, you know, slave under a hot stove or any of those jobs. I can actually go into a bank and, and get an office Slave under a hot calculator. Exactly. You know? Well, it's not as, radi- it's not as, uh, you know, bad for your health, I guess. But right. <laughs> it's still the same thing. But, you know, that's, that's what all parents want, uh, of my generation at least. Um, so I went into university. I made it into university. Thank goodness. In high school, the okay. only thing. So in high school, you weren't making videos. You weren't writing nothing. The only thing I did, the only or... thing I was good at, actually sketches. The only thing I was good at was art class and drama. Mm. And the only reason why I got into drama is because I was an introvert, and I'm like, okay, I I'm so scared to be in front of people that maybe if I take drama, it can force myself to be a little more comfortable. Right. Yeah. Right. Turned out I was pretty good at that stuff. But I was still terrified. Even to today, I'm still terrified to be right. in front of camera or, or in front of people. Yeah. I think yeah. everybody really is. I think so, yeah. That, I think. Yeah. But I was good at it. I was good at making people laugh and that felt good. You know, I think that was a, the main thing was like, oh, I like doing comedy because it made people feel good and that made me feel good. So that was it, right? So when I went to university, again, parents get into economics because everybody they gets wanted you to take economics. economics. And I did take economics, but I got so bored of it. That I'm like, okay, well, I, I'm going to be stuck here for four years. I got to do something else. So, you know, I did a, 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 a double major. I went into, uh, first I went into drama, but I was at the U- University of Toronto and their drama was really just studying plays. You're right. reading plays and you're writing about it and that's it. I'm like, no well, performance. No performance. I'm like, just what the? Well, maybe critical. later on. Yeah, maybe yeah. later on. But yeah, I wasn't cut out for the books and stuff like that. Right. So I, 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 like, I wasn't very good at school, to be honest. I made it. How the heck did you get into U of T? I don't know. I just kind of stumbled in. They're like, okay, come on in. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. It, crazy. But anyway, so the first year I tried drama, I'm like, okay, that's not for me. And then I went into, oh, film studies. They had film studies. So I'm like, okay, I guess I get to uh, learn how to make films, which wasn't the case either because at U of T, University of Toronto, it's just studying film and writing about it. Right. I can't imagine that there's much hands-on No, you're a film critic. There. That's all it yeah. is. So I did that, which was fine, you know, and people are always like, you, you have economics uh, as one major and you have film as the other. What the heck are you going to do with your life? I'm like, I don't know, I, you know, and yeah. it still rings today. I don't know. But it kind of worked out because when I stepped out of university, one of the first jobs I had was working at a production house that made commercials, because, which is economics, you know, for TV, which is right. film and television. And yeah. I learned all my uh, practical, you know, hands on skills through that and also I worked for a television station which okay, was what was the first job coming right out of university what was your first job gap selling clothing the gap selling clothing. <laughs> oh. so I put on a performance like oh this is great this t-shirt is great right. but apart from that my first job kind of dabbling into the industry right was at Fairchild television uh television yeah yeah Fairchild TV yeah with yours truly right, right here right yeah in fact let people know my first mentor <laughs> which I still look up to today my good friend Dean Rainey, right here in front of me. Yeah, I remember when he came in, and I was like, oh, "What does this Chinese kid think he's doing? Coming here and work for this Chinese channel? He doesn't know anything." <laughs> exactly. And the first thing, first thing I thought when he came is, "What is this white dude here in the Chinese television television station teaching me how to be Chinese?" What, what, but you did a great job. Yeah. I learned how to be Chinese. Yeah, it was yeah, amazing. You're much more Chinese than when I first met you. <laughs> no, we worked together. We were both camera assistants, right? No, not really. We were just trying to pick up the chicks there. Right. Which we, we were did pretty all successful. Right. We yeah, did I think all we right. did good. We yeah. both ended up dating hosts. Yep. Yours was a lifestyle culture show host, and I dated a weather girl. I was looking for a hostess, but it was the wrong place. <laughs> 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 but we started off as camera assistants, right? Yes, like, yes. What was that like for you? You weren't there very long, though. No, I wasn't. I think I was only there for like maybe a year. If that. If that. If that. If that, huh? But I had, I had a ball. I had a lot of fun. I mean, I mean, we, there were good people there. You know, you were there, which made a lot of fun. Um, but you learned everything because you got to see. You got to see everything from like a backseat kind of thing, right? And you, you got to touch a lot of stuff, you get, too. You weren't just... Yep, the girls. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yes you did you actually yeah. get you get to play with the cameras and everything like that and they were pretty willing the people there were pretty willing to like just teach you you know bits and pieces about the equipment and and the industry and we luckily you know yes it was a local television station multi-ethnic and everything but there were a lot of uh people that came from the hong kong film industry right 
Hey, wow. Like I mean, they, they were kind of semi-retired here. Yeah. But man, they were... They knew their stuff. They, they had stories stuff. to tell. Yeah. And like, we were young, right? We were sponges and we just like absorbed everything. Yeah. For me, it was interesting because my first job was doing craft service oh. on a big movie. And I thought, oh my gosh, I've hit the big time. I don't care if I'm doing coffees or throwing, you know, making grilled cheese or whatever. I'm on a big Hollywood movie set. But it didn't take me very long to realize I ain't learning a damn thing because I make these grilled cheese and then I take them around set. But that's it. Nobody takes the time to answer your question. Nobody wants to let you touch anything. Everything's unionized. So I think I did like two movies and then I was like, I'm out of here. I've got to learn. I've got to learn because school didn't teach me enough. So it was going to this TV station and then meeting these old school Hong Kong film and television people that I learned all kinds of stuff. And they never taught you how to make sweet and sour chicken balls? And they never did. They didn't no. even know. When I said, hey, we having lunch, we having, you know, chow mein, chop <laughs> suey. They were like, what, what the heck? So I remember I was disappointed when you left, but you did go on to bigger things pretty quick. I mean, you went to a commercial production house. Yeah. You just had to be dumb enough to take the work and, you know, you worked your ass off for minimum pay. So And be Chinese enough, though, I think, because yeah, they I did guess. ethnic advertising right yeah they got the wrong person should have got you but that's a different story i guess <laughs> but yeah that that was uh that was quite interesting as well because you're also you know t television station is one thing but like a production house for commercials was a completely different thing totally. as well you know it's more of like a it's a it's a grind you know it's it's long hours um everything is on a very tight budget but the demand is very high and and also you you know we learned like the multi-ethnic way of doing things, yeah. which is very different from mainstream, which is like making grilled cheese on a set and that's all you do, right? Right. In, in a multi-ethnic place, even in, in Fairchild, it's, uh, you got to do everything, right? You yeah. got to be a ma uh, master of, no, not master jack of, of all, none, jack of all trades, master, master of, of none. none. Yeah. Yeah. But You'll I hear mean, that a lot, I'm sure, throughout this series. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in fact, I'm ho holding Dean's uh, mic right now. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> You're holding Guess mine. and mic uh, stand. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's, it's, it's working for a production company is a bit different than television. Television always to me seemed like nine to five job, a little bit more nine to five, a little bit more it is. sane hours. Yeah. I mean, there are positions in a TV station that are a little bit more intense, but for the general part, it is a nine to five job. It is a company that people go to work and come home and that's it. Yeah. So what was your role in this? Uh, you, you went from camera assistant to this commercial production company. And what was your role there starting out? Well, I guess I was like a junior producer. You know, so right at right at the get go, uh, you know, I'm still doing the assistant stuff. You know, again, jack of all trades kind of thing. But uh, you know, I started learning how to uh, manage a budget. You know, money and stuff like that. Writing up a budget, uh, dealing with uh, booking stuff, booking auditions, uh, lo location scouting, craft service. You got to figure out yeah. where the food's coming from for the crew and everything. So I kind of had to like just be everything uh, for when we're shooting on set you know, including organizing the schedule for the set. So once I organize the schedule, everything, all the, everything's all booked, the budget looks good. And then when I'm on set, I got to make sure everything runs properly while the director kind of takes the center stage and be, becomes a star of the set. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you kind of got thrown in the deep end there a little bit though, because you know, yeah, you could PA production assistant for many years yeah. before you get like locations guy. And then, <laughs> yeah production manager or whatever yeah, right so absolutely. you it was a really good i think opportunity for you to see plus you got to work really closely with a lot of quite established uh tv commercial directors as well yes would you say and got to sometimes yeah and then some, 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 some horrible some ones were really bad <laughs> comes in with attitude big afro yeah oh yeah hades glasses Hades glasses just you know Typical. Dropping that one out there. Um, they, yeah, because it's funny. They say there's only two entry positions on a film set. Do you know what they are? Two entry positions. Yeah, two entry positions on a film set. Uh, that would be a PA and a fluffer. <laughs> Close. <laughs> PA, production uh, assistant and director. Really? Yeah, because a lot of people, you know, they, they can be a graphic artist or yep. an editor and they can walk right in on set and be given the responsibility to direct something. Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, a lot of times you'll be working with directors on set and they are as green as anybody else. They have no idea how things on set work. How and does that's that just even... Creativity. I think creativity trumps experience in that sense. Yeah. It's not something I totally agree with, but it's something you see a lot. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you moved up the ranks there and um, became a producer, I guess, yep. right? I became a producer. 
What's your role as a, what kind of jobs did you do as a, as a producer? Like what's your, what's your role in that? To be honest, it was the exact same thing. <laughs> You're talking about at, at the, yeah. the that company there, yeah. it was the exact same thing. Cause at the end of the day, I'm still putting away the equipment sure. in the back room, climbing up that stairs. I don't know why that company was on the second oh, floor man. when you had at least like HMIs yes. hauling it upstairs. If you have a studio, do not put it on the second Second floor. floor yeah, no. absolutely. But without an elevator. Right. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> But yeah, it for me it was the exact same thing. Uh, like you said, when they got me in there, it was just throwing me into the deep end because it wasn't that big of a company. There was yeah. only three producers, including myself. So I was doing everything. And if like, why did they give me the producer role right at the get go and, and trust me? Well, they didn't. They had other, the more senior producers, kind of oversee everything I did. Uh, so I had to do what they were doing plus all the other PA work and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Any other opportunities to, you know, flex your creative muscles in that role over the, how many years were you there? I was there for, I think, two, three years. Oh, longer than that. It was longer than that. It seemed like you were there a long time. Well, it felt long. Yeah. <laughs> it felt really long. Uh, but, um. Because it was one of those situations, and this is important when you're thinking about a career in this industry. Right. You and I were both in a crossroads, right? Because you, right, absolutely, yeah. you were in a smaller commercial production company. Mm -hmm. They were doing big clients. So they were doing, you know, Sprint. Bell Canada. Bell Canada, you know, a big developers, commercials. But it was still a niche market, right? Ethnic marketing. Yeah, so it yeah. wasn't the mainstream. Yeah, you have so, big companies, but small markets that you're still yeah, dealing so with. Yeah, so budgets are smaller, pays a little bit less, uh, experience a little bit less. And so, but but you're getting, you are getting good experience though, because it is so much smaller. You're getting your hands on everything. Yeah. So you've got to balance like, do I stay here and be stuck in this niche? But then how do I get out to get the experience and where do I go and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Right. So I think uh, in terms of the creative aspect, you know, like you said, there are some directors who are just entry level directors or there are some directors who, who never actually know what they're doing. Right. And I had to deal with a lot of those people. So when the storyboards came in and all that stuff came in. I had to go through all that stuff. And in my mind, I already have an idea of how this stuff should be shot. Yeah. Right. So as a producer, sometimes, you know, you talk about like Jerry Bruckheimer, who's not a director, but you could tell that it's his film. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So there are a lot of stuff where the producer is where they, maybe that's the reason why you have directors coming in as green because you have a strong enough producer that can kind of manage and kind of guide that kind of creative, uh, guide their creative sense into like the proper way of, executing right so in my in 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 that way i was able to creatively i had to understand i had to understand the story i had to envision how it's going to be shot already before going into it um and that that kind of was like a stepping stone for me to start understanding directing and all the other stuff and you're right at the time we had some big clients but it was also on the downturn right where the budget started to shrink yeah because of that, my boss was kind of like, well, yeah, since you've been doing all this stuff, why don't you direct as well? So I had opportunities to direct smaller things, corporate video, small commercials and stuff like that. So I kind of started dabbling into that and I liked it. Would it you say fun. that that's something that was key? Like you got to be hungry to get the, when those opportunities come, you got to take them. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, I think one of the biggest uh, roadblocks for most people is fear. Yep. And if you hear about any success story out there, usually it's just them being an idiot and just jumping into the pool. That's all it is. So, yeah, that's, that's what I did. And, and at the same time, it's kind of like, well, you know, either way I'm getting paid, so what difference does it make? If they're going to trust me, like, it'll be fine. And right. it, again, we had a lot of experienced cameramen, cinematographers and everything that I was fortunate enough to be working with, so I can always just kind of rely on them to help me on the way. And I always had like the super PA that I always hired. <laughs> this guy was awesome. Have you heard of him? Oh yeah. Every once in a while he would get a call he from would get this a production call. company <laughs> and they would say, come and just PA for a couple of days. And I'd say, I can't do it anymore. I'm directing a TV series, Berman. I don't PA anymore. Yeah, and he would really, I guess, give me an offer that I couldn't refuse and I didn't refuse it. And then I bitched the whole time I was <laughs> working time. for Every you. single time this BA came in at the end, he would just grab me by the throat and go, Hey Berman, this is the last time. Never again. And my answer to him is sure, sure it is. Let's right. just finish the shot. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, actually I have to be honest. Like that's the reason why I was able to go through, you know, the trial by fire is because I also had great support. Yeah. Whether people knew it or not. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So once things started to sort of, I guess, wrap up at that, um, production company. Yeah. What, what choices did you have to further your career? Oh man, I didn't have a lot of choices to be honest with you. I, 
because how it wrapped up was basically 9-11 happened. Oh. Planes flew into the building, and next thing you know, I was uh, laid off because I was the youngest of the three producers. Right. And uh, yeah, so I was, you know, I, I didn't know what to do with myself because because I was jack of all trades, because I went through this, you know, unorthodox, unconventional way of going, you know, learning the craft and everything. A lot of mainstream companies wouldn't even give me a chance. It wouldn't even, they were like, okay, I can give you like volunteer work. Right. And that really pissed me off because I was dealing with fairly, in my mind, fairly big budgets at that time, you know, $100,000, $200,000. That's still a good size. Yeah. Uh, and, and now I'm going around, you know, showing my reel, giving my resume and people even like yelled at me for even having the, the courage to go and, and submit a resume. I think that's horrible. I that think was the that issue is then, though, absolutely you know? horrible. Oh, hey, it's changed a lot. It's man. changed a lot. It's yeah. changed a lot. Yeah, yeah absolutely. no, it was absolutely a lot of barriers back in the day, and it was full of elites. And if you weren't in the clique, you weren't in. Yeah. So my my option was not much. You know, I went back back to like you know taking courses to learn like other things I could do and stuff like that. Uh, but luckily, even though did I you did, think about leaving the industry? I did because I just didn't know how to get back in. Yeah. You know, not that I was like, oh, uh, like I was, I was discouraged, you know, but I mean, obviously I'll, I'll keep on looking, but I had to at some point realize, okay, well I need to like eat, yeah, you know, I need to make money. Um, so I did, but, uh, luckily, even though I did get laid off, that company still came back and hired me as a freelancer for certain jobs. And, uh, the jobs weren't really coming in from Canada, but they were coming in from Asia. Right. And there was this one which was for Sony Ericsson. The client was from uh, Singapore. The director was from Taiwan. Big production. Came here. I think I got my super PA on that one too, I think. No, I was in Hong Kong at this time. Oh, you're already there? Yeah. Oh. After, right after 9-11. No wonder it was such a difficult shoot. Yeah, it was totally difficult. Without yeah. <laughs> <laughs> without me there to empty the garbage cans. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, um, you know, that happened. You know, uh, I did some, some of these overseas jobs and stuff like that. Uh, shot in Canada, shot in Toronto and everything. And uh, one of the agencies, creative agencies uh, from Singapore, when after the job came up to me and said, would you be interested in coming over to Singapore and working for us? I'm like, what? And this is like, you, you have to understand, before this, it was only like my options were production house. Yeah. That's all it was, right? But the idea of, oh, creative agency, I can actually learn about creative, coming up with concepts, you know, yeah. more on the directing side and stuff like that. or even, Kind of. Kind, kind of. of. Directing is different, but... Agencies and production companies, very different. Very different. Beasts, that is true. And we will find this out as we go through your story. Here. Yeah. yeah. So I'm like, sure, it's not like I'm making anything. But they're like, well, you're not going to get paid much because you have no experience. This is your first job ever. So I, I'm like, you know what? what because what it was on the agency side. Agency You'd side. You had four never... years of production yeah. experience, but that did, meant nothing for It meant nothing. The like, let's side. clarify this. When you're in a production house, all you're giving is, all you are given is a creative concept plus a storyboard. And you just have to execute yeah, that story. You are executors, right? yes. The the closest thing you get to it is that you you do offer you do hire the director or you take part in hiring the director who actually helms the project. Yeah. And from there, I work. I I was able and fortunate enough to work closely with those directors in how this kind of storyboard kind of form, which gave me the taste of you know the the creative side. So when you go to agency, none of that like I've done. Right. But, and then now this this company is like, oh, we'll you know we'll we'll bring you into Singapore. We'll pay you next to nothing, but you get to learn everything that you always wanted to learn, or at least I don't—I didn't know if I want to learn it, but you had this opportunity. Yeah, and I mean, I had nothing to lose. I was young. I'm like, sure, why not? And I literally was living paycheck to paycheck. I still remember like being in Singapore for the first couple of months and going, okay, today is you know tomorrow is payday. Today I have three fifty in my pocket. What should I eat? And that was that was the mindset every month yeah for for that one year that i was in singapore but it was like i've i was lucky because the agency was a boutique agency the uh creative director who was also the owner of the company was fantastic she's considered one of the top 10 creative minds in asia at that time yeah and i was just so lucky that she took me under wing so i got paid nothing but i learned so much and it was amazing what was your what was your job title there uh i i was um janitor <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I was actually, I didn't have enough experience to actually be on the creative side. So yeah. when it comes to an agency, you have two sides. You have the suits, which are the people that go and sell, you know, and meet clients and stuff like Manage that. Manage the clients. Manage and clients, yeah. And then you have the creative side, which is the copywriters and art directors and your creative director. That's the, that's the set. And yeah. you also have like a small little department, which are one or two people who are production. But what they do is either help, help the creatives uh, 
produce print because we were doing print ads like for a campaign yeah and they also were the ones who go out and and is like the middle person between the production house out there and the advertising agency um yeah so where i was was they put me on the suit side because i was the only side that i could probably do anything you look creative. good in the suit yeah i've never uh, do i thank yeah. you thank you i always <laughs> felt that but singapore is too hot to be wearing a suit but anyways it is too hot so oh. i never wore a suit actually yeah so. No, it's interesting because the production company and the agency, two, diff- two different beasts that must work together. Yep. But then within the agency, two different divisions, I would say, that have to work together as well. Absolutely. So you were on the, what do we call it, the accounts? The accounts side. side. Yeah, account yeah. Servicing. servicing. Yeah. Yeah. They call it the suits, but it's just account servicing. Yeah. And that was the only side where, you know, they could justify what the peanuts that they're paying me. Right. You know, that I'm actually dealing with clients. I'm sending emails out looking at uh, quotes and stuff like that, which was which I had experience in, right? Economics degree. Right. Economics degree. There you yeah, go, right? Boom. But, uh, you know, the boss knew that I had an interest, you know, the creative director knew I had an interest in the creative. So she's like, you know what? Why don't you, if you have the time on your own, you could you could sit in on those creative meetings uh, on, the, on the jobs that, that are coming in and you can also pitch your ideas as well. So I did that. So I was doing the suit thing on one side, you know, doing the client servicing. But on the other side, I would be offering my ideas and everything. I mean, most of them got shot down. Some of them kind of made it through to a certain, uh, to a certain degree. Uh, but, you know, the creative director was kind of like, it's great because you're not, you're not trained for this stuff. But you're coming in with these, you're hungry and you have all these ideas. And it's actually challenging the rest of my other team. Right. Right. So I guess some of them may not have liked me. Because I was like this guy who just had the opportunity. He's like, who the hell are you? You never went to school for this. You never right. had training. But uh, she liked that. She liked the fact that I was there to push the rest of the team. Yeah. And, and it was great. So. And yeah. if you're thinking outside the box, there's no constraints at all. You're, you're throwing What I have to lose? There. It didn't yeah. matter, right? So I just threw everything out there. And it was fun. It was great. And, and what's, what's more fun was that uh, not only did I, was I able to see the creative concepts that are coming out of the team, but I was also be able, I was, people were critiquing my idea or helping me shape the ideas I have and you know I'll, I'll forever be grateful that I had the opportunity for these people and they were really talented people to be giving me feedback on the stuff I had any frustrations with this role of balancing between two departments in an agency uh the frustration was just the money part I guess I mean I understood that that here's the one thing right I think for everybody who's listening out there the reality is no matter what success that you see other people have the nine times out of 10, those people work their asses off for it. So, you know, I wasn't afraid to like, you know, work my ass off. Right. Because that's how, I mean, my parents worked their ass off to get, to give me what I have now. Right. Yeah. So I was fine with it. I mean, you're you're obviously going to be frustrated, but at the end of the day, you're like, you know, at least I had this opportunity. But wasn't there some frustrations with uh, your your senior report uh, on the account side? Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. They that that <laughs> well, I'm talking about the creative side, right? But you're absolutely right. On the on the other side, they're like, "Hey, how come you're not 100 percent on you know on with us with us kind of thing?" <laughs> and really, the the funny thing was, it was just my direct uh, direct report which was having issues with me like that. He he was a business guy. Yeah, he was a Menza, which I think is like just the higher tier of like people with high IQ and stuff right. like that. Low 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 EQ. Right. But uh, I think there was some sense of jealousy that. The boss, which was semi-related to him, uh, you know, was giving me these opportunities. And he was kind of like, what the hell? You just came in and you get to do both. Like, that's not how the system works. Right. So right. He was very kind of like, you know, this is systems. not cool kind of thing. But uh, part, I mean, now looking back, at that time, I was having a lot. I think I'm pretty sure I told you stories and stuff like that. But now I completely I haven't, you know, I don't remember this stuff. But yeah, you're <laughs> right. I don't because you look back and you realize... Who cares? It wasn't that important. It wasn't that important. I mean, that's the one thing. Kids out there, you know, yes, you might have dropped your ice cream, but check, trust me, in a month's time or next year, it wouldn't be a big deal. Another ice cream truck is coming. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I mean, if you are going to get upset about bumps in the road, oh my gosh, because there's going to be tons of bumps in the road. I don't even sweat anything anymore now. I mean, it's nice to hit. But I think there's a difference though. Yeah. (laughs) But I think there's a difference between, uh, between you and I and everybody else out there was because we went through an interesting route going into Asia yeah, and stuff like that, where it's kind of like you, you it's, it's tough. I think it's a very different kind of environment than here, you know, in what way in, 
it's it's here it's very i guess in our generation maybe now it's different but in our generation like you said right it's very regulated you go through the system it is what it is kind of thing and you're privy to this you yeah. know you kind of step it up like that right but in asia it's just a wild west kind of thing and kind of you kind of have to fight for everything yeah strongest survives right strongest right survive now. and and i've seen you go through it you know and i i think i've gone through some of it so for us it's kind of like yeah i think we're a lot more zen because we went through that Maybe that's really why Zen and all that stuff came from Asia. Yeah, probably. Because <laughs> they had to or else they'll kill themselves. So how long do you stay at this agency? I was there for just one year. What's, can you say the name of it? Uh, 10 a.m. Communications. Yeah. Yeah. Um, how, many, how long did you stay? Sorry. One year. One year. Yeah. And then what happened? Well, the year came up near the end and I'm sitting there going, oh, man, I'm, I haven't saved a single cent because basically I couldn't afford to save a single right. cent. I'm not, I don't drink. I don't go out that much, right? All I do is like, I go to morning movies at that time because it was cheaper. Yeah. And you buy a lot of shoes. I No, at that time I didn't. <laughs> I went to look at a lot of shoes. That okay. my, my entertainment is, I'm a sneakerhead for yeah. those who don't like why, why shoes, not, not lady shoes. <laughs> <laughs> that would be weirder. That would be weirder, right? Yeah. I'm a sneakerhead. So, and that's where it started because, you know, I used to love cars and everything, but when I went to Asia, you walk, you didn't drive. So right. My means of transportation were my shoes or my feet, which are attached to shoes. Right. So I went and just shoe shop. Like I went to these sneaker places and everything. I never bought anything, but that's, you know, that's, I couldn't, I had no money. Right. Uh, but after a year came and I was like, okay, well, do I continue? Because I don't see me getting a raise. I wouldn't give myself a raise. I'm not adding value or not tangible. Like I'm not making the company make more money. Right. Right. It's not like my, my concepts are selling. Right. And to be honest, there are a lot more other suits or, or account servicing people that are better than me. You know, for, for one thing, I'm a foreigner. Like, I don't really know the market as well. Right. So I get that, right? And I was really appreciative with the, with the stuff. So I was thinking, what should I do? Should I stay a little longer or should I go home? But lo and behold, a good friend of mine um, who was working in Hong Kong at the time, Jason, um, he was in National Geographic, and they were looking for someone to deal with the crap that nobody else wanted to deal with, um, which was advertising sales so at that time national geographic they were they were starting to produce their own commercials for the clients but they all, all they had was a bunch of promo producers who used to just cut footage and make uh, commercials for their own shows and there was no client right right but now they're they've been uh kind of just thrown into this world where they had to make commercials for clients and they all hated it because they're like my job description never needed me to go deal with a client my only right. client was my creative director yeah. Right. So they all hated that. They loved the traveling. They loved the idea of it. But when they started dealing with clients, they couldn't deal with it. Yeah. So they wanted a producer that they can throw all that garbage to. And I'm sitting here going, oh, I'm getting paid peanuts. <laughs> me, me, me. I'll take it. Yeah. So, yeah, they brought me in. So I moved to Hong Kong and I joined National Geographic as wow. their uh, loan producer. Well, at the time, loan producer to create uh, commercials for their clients. Because this was a new thing, right? Where I think uh, in the traditional advertising world, you have a client and they want to make a TV commercial to put on air. So then they'll, they'll retain a advertising agency. And within that advertising agency, they'll come up with the creative concept. And then maybe they have a, a media buyer in house or they'll outsource that. And then they'll buy all the time, the airtime on the network. And then they'll air a commercial. It's pretty expensive to do it that way, right? Yeah, I that's mean, the traditional way, though. That's the way you do it. Yeah. yeah. And, and then I think National Ge Geographic in Asia just decided, hey, let's just undercut all those people in the middle and we'll just deal directly with the client. Absolutely. Um, I mean, National Geographic was late to the game in yeah. terms of being a television stage or television uh, channel. Uh, before that, before they existed, uh, Discovery, Discovery Channel was around for at least 10, 15 years before that. Yeah. So they had a stranglehold towards that type of market. Whoever wanted to, uh, like nonfiction, documentary kind of thing, that TV uh, channel to advertise on those channels, it would just be Discovery. So Nat Geo, nobody's going to Nat Geo. So Nat Geo had to do something in order for them to gain the, those ad sales dollars. Yeah. And what they did was like, hey, why don't you come to us? Let's cut the middleman out. We'll make the commercial free for you. Yeah. And that's that was a big draw. Changed that's how everything. Started. The difference between North America and Asia is that like here, we don't really think, we think National Geographic, we think the magazine. Mm. Discovery Channel, okay, there's Caesar Milan or whatever. But like in Asia, those brands are huge. So there's Discovery Channel, National Geographic, CNN. Those are your big three broadcasters, I would say. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, in a way, it's kind of like know North, America, North American education. 
yeah. in a sense, right? And that's what they're getting. Yeah. Yeah. It was like the magazine had that prestige or those channels had that prestige and people had it. They may not actually watch it, but they'll have it. Yeah. yeah. So your first job there was as a producer then? Yeah. Producer for ad sales. Yeah. Yeah. What was that like? <laughs> that was, that was nuts. Yeah. To be honest with you, it was nuts because... You know, I, I now at that point, I've been trained in a production house environment. I've been trained in advertising agency environment. I kind of do that kind of side. Right now I'm coming into an environment where the creative director uh, at no fault of his and also his team had no clue of any of this. Not even any idea that it existed. Yeah, almost. they had no like, idea. They just they these they had never ever. Right. So there was together. no structure. There was no concept. Yeah. They just kind of like just did things on the fly and just kind of guess their way out of it, right? So maybe make a promo, throw a logo on the end and say, brought to you by blah, blah, blah. That would maybe be the extent of something. Yeah, absolutely, right? And that's all it is. So now, out of nowhere, I came in. They're like, okay, we need you to go over to the Maldives next week. To do what? To shoot a commercial. What's the concept? They want to, <laughs> do, to do a commercial. Well, we'll get a Nat Geo photographer and, this, and our camera and we'll put them in the Maldives. Phil. Yeah, and that's it. Two there's, minutes. In two minutes. And it's yeah. like, there's no there's no uh, concept. There's no storyboard. There's nothing. And it's like, go do it. And it's like, what? Are you kidding me? So that's how it all starts. So I had to start. I had to do what, I mean, I'm, I'm the new guy. So I have to just kind of go and just do whatever they asked me to do. And then through the, you know, through the beginning few months and through the years, I kind of had to slowly kind of educate. So manage upwards kind of thing. Yeah on how this should be done because a lot of times it's like you go in you shoot you're like okay what am i supposed to shoot you only have like you may have one day of location scout and one day of shooting which means in that one in that first day you have to figure out exactly what the concept will be what the storyboard or anything or not even a storyboard right right because you didn't have time and the next day you have to shoot it and then you go back and you edit whatever you had and you're hoping to god that this is going to come out and it might actually look okay right right there are times where client doesn't know but you know, they don't know. They're like, oh, go shoot it. Come back. And they're like, well, that's not what we were thinking. It's like, well, you never told us what we're think- you were thinking. And, you know, you get in a lot of trouble, right? <laughs> and the salespeople were like, oh, it's because the producer, which would be me. Right. Didn't know what he was doing. Like the blame would be coming down to me. Sure. Right. So I had to there's slow- just no system. There was no, no system. In the advertising agency, they have a system. Yeah. They know who's responsible for what and right. deadlines and milestones and all that. Exactly. Yes. So very quickly, you have to learn that. I have to start implementing some sort of system to protect myself, to protect my job. Right. Right. So that's how I started building the system and building team at National Geographic. So you were a producer in this capacity. Yeah. Now you were also like in the early days back to the production company, you were a producer there, but two, same title, two totally different jobs. Oh yeah, absolutely. Again, the production company managing budgets, Maybe helping the director that, but then this one. This one, I was the fire department, putting out major fires. I guess it wasn't. It was. And cr- but creating the content, you actually. Yeah, had, I had to create the content. Yeah, absolutely. You had to create absolutely the right. con, the creative. Yep. And then go out and execute, and actually direct it yourself. Actually direct it myself. Yeah. And edit it yourself. And edit it myself. Yeah. Yeah. So it was like a one man band and doing everything that we had to do. Uh, there was no senior at that time that really could make a judgment or guide me or, you know, overlook what I was doing. So it's kind of like, I'm just guessing and just hoping that it'll be, fine. if anything, it goes wrong. It's on me. Right. That's what it is. Right. And I, I, and again, I like to emphasize it was no fault of like national geographic or anybody that was above me or my manager saying, cause they were in the same situation where suddenly management said, okay, you're going to have to do this. Or the sales team told them, okay, we just sold this now go do it. Right. Right. But yeah, that's, that's the environment I was in. So how do you rate that experience? Uh, Gave me a lot of gray hairs. Yeah. Every every uh, every month I went to my barber, my barber was like, "What are you doing? Why is <laughs> really? your hair turning? Yeah, really? no, I'm serious. I'm serious. I'm, I'm not even joking here. Wow. He's like, "What is going on here? Yeah. Um. So that was that, and I would say it made me the person I am today. Yeah. Whether it's good or bad. Right. But it definitely kind of formed me into the person I am. And um, I was, you know what? This is where the creative director kind of thing start falling in. I, I Going through those years, it was tough. It was really, really tough. I can't, I mean, looking back, it's enjoyable, but going through it was tough. And I realized that the resentment that I had was like, there's nobody above me to teach me more. Right. And I came from Singapore where I had a great mentor in the creative director that I had. She was fantastic. 
to this to this environment where it's I'm all on my own and I just wish that I had someone to turn to to go am I doing it right yeah that's a really good point because our instinct is I'm right I want to do it my way really as a creative I think we all struggle with this but don't underestimate what experience or mentorship from somebody else can do yeah to bring you to bring you up and if you don't have that especially when you're kind of young and this was really your first position where you were really responsible for the creative and the execution. I mean, the other ones you had your hands on it, yeah. but it was ultimately fell on the director or the creative team at the agency. But here it was like, how do you cut? Like, how do you shoot a scene so that it cuts together? Yeah. And then it makes sense. Yeah. And then mixing the audio and all of this stuff. Yeah. And I was never in all the previous jobs. I was Jack of all trade. I was never a professional or an expert in any of these things that I'm now kind of responsible for. Yeah. So, but it was amazing. It's I mean, got to be amazing to it's, get it's that amazing, yeah. kind of experience. Yeah. What are your thoughts on Jack of all trades, master of none versus, versus specializing in something? Oh man, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Um, I think there's a place for both. Yeah. And I think the ideal thing for anybody would be to start as a Jack of all trades and then, you know, choose the, the trade that you really want to become a master in. And I see it like that. Uh, unfortunately, I think as ideal as that might sound, and that's, that's like, I guess, encouraging the younger people in the younger generation to go and just try everything before they kind of settle on anything. Yeah. But you know, the way I did it and the way I'm sure you did it was pretty much the necessity of life, right? Like it wasn't, I didn't choose this route. The route kind of was, I was just chosen for the route kind of right, thing. Right. So I, I did it the way I did because I had to survive. Um, so, you know. There's nothing wrong with being jack of all trades, but there's also nothing wrong with being. There's good and bad to both, I would say. Yeah, yeah, and um, I think when I look at the generation now, the YouTube generation, which which is what I call it, it's probably leaning towards the jack of all trades more than anything nowadays. So that's the trend. So if I could tell you, if I tell you, oh, it's, there's all these benefits of being a master of something, well, you could be, but you might not survive in 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 the in the distant future. Yeah, right. So it all depends. It's tough. It's a tough because. I think, you know, jack of all trade opens up a lot of doors, but you're never really good at anything. Good and then at, yeah. sort of the craftsman or the expertise is kind of, yeah. is kind of lost. Although it has worked for me. Oh yeah. That was, I was just going to say, but tell still you. there are, there's not, Hey, there's not many days that don't go by where I wish I wasn't better at something. Oh yeah. Where absolutely. I was like, okay, I can come in and I can do a kick-ass rough cut. But if you want a bunch of effects and everything, yeah, I got to pass it off to somebody else. Yeah, so. no, absolutely right. I think, you know, I was just going to say, you know, someone like you, you, which you have your own business, which has flourished in the past three years, it's, it was an absolute necessity that you were a jack of all trades. Right. First off, because you have, when you start a business, you got to have to do everything yourself. Secondly, when you now are starting hiring other people or bring people into your team, which you have, you got to know how to teach them. Right. Every aspect. Or if you have freelancer coming in, they can't bullshit you anymore. It's like, are you kidding me? I've done exactly what you've done. I know. It might not be as good, but I know, so don't bullshit me. That's right. That, yeah. that helps a lot. Oh, yeah. Lot. Okay, so all these gray hairs, how did you deal with that stress? Did you ever want to walk away or what kept you going? Oh, yeah, I wanted to quit. I think everybody in that, in that system wanted to quit. Um because you started what? off, you were one, you were a one man department. Oh yeah, basically. So, so the first thing I did as a one man department, I mean, implement stuff and then stuff like that. So instead of preventing me from quitting, I I called my super PA. <laughs> <laughs> one more gig, Randy. One more gig, <laughs> and I got I got you in, which helped tremendously. So now it's not just me. I got another person who's exactly like me, if not better. A little more angry, but <laughs> <laughs> the angry white man. Um, yeah. And you know, I think that's what made me going because it was growing, you know, yeah. every day I was like, Oh my God, like this, I, I swear every it was time, a crazy time. it was a crazy time. I would go in every job and every day, every time I come out of that shoot or whatever it is, I, I would go home thinking this might be my last gig cause they're going to figure out that I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, and this is going to turn out horribly and I'm going to get fired. But right? you were lucky because all of those people that you're talking about didn't know what they were doing. So you actually had one up on them. I just remember like my frustration just came. I mean, you were doing your best to put in systems, but there was just, they either, the people that we had to work with either wouldn't follow those systems or still just had like no idea. Yeah. Because it was, was inconvenient on, for them, right? So. It was inconvenient. So they were like, yeah. why? It doesn't make any sense. So yeah. why should they listen to you? Right. Understandably so. But, uh, you know what? The, 
the opportunity for me to start building my team, you know, first bring you in and then start like, you know, bring other producers in and stuff like that gave me a purpose for staying. Yeah. Right now it's like, okay, now I have a new challenge, which is not just kind of putting these fires and making these videos. It was like managing a team, which was something that at least I know I'm growing. Yeah. And there can be, I feel that there could be a creativity to that or something like it is fulfilling. Oh yeah. What you did. And you were very good at this, uh, in the years that you were there, honestly. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I think, uh, you know, this is, this is where it's funny when you first started this podcast, you asked about like the definition, definition of a creative director. And I still remember like I was starting to manage this team of two, three, four, whatever. And I was still wondering, okay, well, my creative director didn't know what I was doing because he wasn't from that world. Right. So I'm like trying to figure out what, 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 what should I do as a creative? I'm not, I wasn't a creative director, but I knew that that's the role that I'm doing. So, you know, a, a friend of mine, Jason, again, he sent me this thing that he found online, which is saying how a proper creative director should be and how most people are not. And I kind of followed that. I read that. I took it too hard and I kind of followed it to a T and started building my team in that way. And I think the challenge of and what I realized was a lot of people don't want to do it that way because it's so much harder to be a true creative director than to just go out there, get the glory come with your own creative and just so be it. And eventually you just leave and move on to something else. Right. Right. I wanted to do it right. I wanted to do it properly. And it was hard, you know, but that kind of drove me to keep on going for the next few years after that. Uh, was that an important thing? I mean, you were very, you looked for people, it seemed that were teachable. Yeah. Where you could, where you had the choice. Anyways, we had, yeah. What I had the choice. When you were hiring, but you really did try to, to try to mentor everybody. It wasn't about you being the most senior creative producer there it was yeah really what, now when you built your team what kind of roles did you fill there uh well really it's just having more producers more producers more producers graphic I, I had a graph eventually i got to a point where i started adding graphics a graphics team yeah like i had two graphics team uh under my wing uh eventually i had a copywriter yeah as well but really the copywriter was more for um the presentation because if you have a good yeah pitching because if you had a good idea and you can't sell it it doesn't mean anything right right um, so I had all those different roles, which was something that I had to learn as well. Like, what are these roles doing? I, I wasn't a graphics guy. I wasn't a copywriter, you know, so I had to kind of learn that and also learn that, like, for example, a copywriter who came in, wrote copy, like wrote long form copy. I had to teach him how to write 30 second spots. Right. Right. I had to, how do you tell a story within 30 seconds? To me, that was a challenge always. Why, why I always like doing commercials. A lot of people are like, why do you do commercials? Like, well, it's a, it's a challenge. In 30 seconds, you have to grab people's attention, tell a story, and make them want to buy crack. Yeah. Or cocaine, whichever right. you're selling. <laughs> and that was a, and that was it's a not that easy, but it can be done. It can be done. That's why sometimes I get clients and they're like, they've got, they, they've got the script is like 30 pages and they're selling something. And I'm like, if we're really any good at this, we can sell this in 30 seconds. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it can be done. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you know what? The other thing was like a lot of people are like, oh my God, this product is so bad. Well, that's the challenge, right? Or people are like, oh my goodness, I don't have the budget to do. Well, that's the creativity that comes in. What can you do creatively to to take a piece of turd yeah. and sell it uh, and, and have a budget of, uh, you know, less than a turd yeah. <laughs> to make people want turd? Okay. That's the challenge. That's where creativity comes in. And, you know, that's also another thing that drove me yeah. by my team. Constraints can really uh, pull out the best in your creativity. It's Absolutely. tough, but... It, they really do. They really do work in that way. Yeah. So do you have any tips to share that you learned from being a creative director? So you're at a broadcaster, but you're handling the sort of in-house advertising team. Mm -hmm. The tips I would have as a, as a, as a creative director. Yeah. I would say you have to, you have to understand your team, the people that you're working with. You know, I remember a, a good friend of mine when he was going through um, an MBA he was telling me, oh, yeah, this is what I learned. It's like, you know, when you go out there managing people, you have to understand that you'll never get people with the qualities that are exactly what you need. Right. You have to identify their strengths, their weaknesses, and work with them on their strengths to make it into, like, to, to, to make, uh, help them become who they can be. And that's what he was taught. And I, and I took that to heart and I realized that, okay, well, there's one thing about looking for people who are teachable. But it's also, you can't force them to be who they're not. You got to have to take their, uh, take their certain qualities and try to amplify that. So I think it's not about imposing your will of what is needed. I mean, there's certain parts where you have to push, obviously. But you have to understand who you're pushing and you know, what their potential will be or can be. 
And you got to work around that. To be a true creative director, that's how you're supposed to do it. You're not imposing your will. You're not just telling people actually you're creative. You're trying to get the best out of your team. And mm. for you to do that, it's kind of like a racing car. You have to know what's under the hood. You have to know what it can do, what the limits are before you can actually push it. So in, my, in that sense, that's what you have to do as a creative director is really truly understand the people that you're working with. So if you were at the top of the tree, the creative tree there in your department, as creative director, yep. where did you draw inspiration or uh, motivation or where did you get your mentorship at that point? At that point, when I'm at the top of the tree is that you're no longer being judged for your individual work. You're being judged uh, for the work of your team. So the motivation was that you, you soon, soon realize that you can't do it. You can't do everything yourself. I think for the first year when I actually was like in that kind of position, I was trying to do everything myself. And even yeah. my boss was like, you know, you can't just keep on maintaining that. Around. I'm like, okay, I get it, I get it. So the motivation was to learn how to step back and actually be inspired by your own team. Right. You know, what you learn is like, kind of like, you have to look back and go, okay, when I was younger, when I was a wide-eyed producer kind of thing, I had a lot of great ideas. I believed in myself and stuff like that. And I wanted people to believe in that too, right? And I, I still, like, looking back today, I look at those ideas. I'm like, oh, those are great ideas. So just because they're not as experienced as me doesn't mean their ideas are not good. So I had to very quickly realize that my, create, my junior graphics team, who are very experienced now, or my junior producers, they all had great ideas, right? And, they, and those ideas kind of inspired me. I was learning from them now. I'm like, right. you know, I got, I, I'm the old dog. I have to admit that I'm the old dog. I can't keep on just being in my own world because that world will die. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to, you know, apart from, the, you know, going out, listening to music, watching movies and stuff like that and talking to friends and all stuff and living life. My own team also gave me inspiration to keep on going. I think that is a super important point. And it is not something that we see enough of, I think, in this industry, because yeah. as I was moving up through the industry, I would come across two types of I'll call them senior creatives. These could be producers. These could be directors. They could be writers. There were those that were scared of you yeah. because you're younger and you're hungrier and you're full of piss and vinegar <laughs> and they're kind of getting older and slower and whatnot. And so they don't help you. They kind of keep you at arm's length and kind of they don't encourage you. Yeah. Okay. Cause yeah. For fear that you're going to replace them. Or there's the other kind that go, okay, you're full of that piss and vinegar, but I'm going to use that and I'm going to bring the experience that I have with me yeah. of coming up through the ranks and I'll kind of work with that yeah. and I'll give you an opportunity and one day you will replace me, but not fully because you still need me and my experience or something like that, yeah. right? Does yeah. that make sense? Did absolutely, absolutely. Um, and you know, I have to say the corporations um, above, like so the bosses above the creative director usually don't help this situation as well yeah like in my experience i had other producers coming up in my in my system or my team that i could tell that my boss was grooming to replace me that's odd that's odd right yeah but it happens yeah. it happens and um in my mind it was like okay I, two things could happen i can push that person down and take all the bigger jobs and shine myself right or i can just do my job yeah right so i chose to just do my job and you know in a way it worked out it did. It did. I mean, it did. It worked out. And at least at the end of the day, I could say I didn't screw anybody over. No. I tried to encourage and help everybody that was under my team or under me and my team. And if they did better than me, great. I did my job. Yeah. Uh, and I, at, at the end of the day, when I go home, I can say I could live with myself. I did my job. I, I was a good creative director because that's what a creative director is supposed to be. Yeah. I, yeah. Would, I would agree with that. Was there frustrations with having a creative role in such a corporate structure? Yes, absolutely. Uh, and again, it's really just not just, you know, when I first came in, my uh, the people I was working with, my career director and all the other producers had no clue about the, the world that I was coming from, right? Yeah. The advertising world. And their bosses, you know, uh, the VPs, CEOs and everything, and all the salespeople out there didn't know either. So the frustration was it was me. It wasn't just me against my creative director or me against the client. It was me against the entire company. And that was the frustrating part. Right. They never. Yeah. And you know what? They're, it's not their job to understand because they're, they're not from this world. Right. I don't blame anybody for not knowing this world because it's not their world. Right. Right. So I think now looking back, I, I'm not angry. Or they frustrated. could have been a little bit more open minded. They could have, but they had their own budgets. Yeah. Right. I, like I, I did a little uh, spoof on my own company where I'm making fun of my own my boss at that time. 
But at the end of the video, I do say, you know, the reality is that we've got pressure. We've got budgets to, to meet. My boss does too. Yeah. Right. What do you think they're doing? They're just dicking around. No, they're, they're here because they have to do their job. And sometimes the way they have to do it may not really agree with how you're doing it. But at the end of the day, they're just trying to do their job as well. Right. Right. And if you can understand that, if you can understand people are just trying to survive, trying to keep their job. Nobody's trying to kill anybody here. It's just things may not always agree. If you can see that, then you're kind of okay with it. It's hard to see though when you're middle. It's very middle hard when you're in the midst of it. I mean, it took yeah. me many years. Probably coming out of it to really see. Near the tail, tail end, you know. Yeah. And and you know what? The, the thing was, my team that was under me was so frustrated with all the salespeople. So frustrated with our bosses and everything because they didn't see and they didn't care. That... It almost became my job to help them see so that they can get through it easier and not quit on me. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. Right. I mean, it was a revolving door. There was a couple yeah. of producer uh, roles that it just kept on getting new people. And I kept on had to train and train and train because they couldn't hack it. They couldn't yeah. handle it. And I re quickly realized I have to teach them that this mentality that nobody's trying to screw you over. It's just that's just the reality of it. If you see that and you don't see the malice in everybody, it's a little easier to get through. Yeah, for sure. What advice would you give to someone who is thinking about that? They think they hear this and they think I'd like to be a creative director. I'd like to, I'm interested in the team building and all of that. What advice would you give to them for, uh, as far as working towards that? Working towards that? You can't, you can't be in your own world. You should really just be out there absorbing everything else. You know, it's not just about your creative and, and pushing that it's about everything else. So it's, it's a, it's a bigger scope than just being a glorified producer or a glorified director. Uh, it's a lot more than that. So being able to understand more outside of your realm will help you. But I think that's with every any other industry as well. You know, just for those who are able to manage and be at that level, you have to understand more than what you know right now. So go out there, be a sponge and be open minded. I think that's a very big thing. Be open minded to stuff so that you don't you, you're not you're not the roadblock for, to yourself. Right. Yeah, that's an important thing. So the reason I, I, I started this podcast was that I, I just kept getting asked by kids and kids' parents, oh, I want to work in television or I want to work in movies. What do I do? You know, there's no clear cut way like a teacher, you go to teacher's college and then you do be a substitute or whatever. Like, in, as I hear with talking with everybody, there's, you can get into this industry so many different ways. But the big question is, do I go to film school? Do I not go to film school? What's your advice to a high school student, grade 12, wants to get into the business. What is my, don't do it, don't do it the way I did it. That's one thing. Or don't even get into a period. Really? <laughs> really? I, I don't know. Because right now, when you look at the industry, it's changing so much. Yeah. You know, TV is no longer, I mean, let's, the term now is like just, you know, Netflix and chill. Yeah. You know, that, that term itself, I mean, it means other things, but also t tells you that, it's not about TV, you know, it's not about going home and turning on TV. It's about turning on Netflix, like other content and everything. So, well, this is a whole other discussion. This whole discussion, I still yeah, think yeah. People are still making content. They are making content. Yeah. What would, I don't know what the, what I would. Do you them. recommend to study? I guess I'll just make it clear. Let's just do, cause this can be a bit of a poll. Yeah. Do you recommend studying film in university or going to film school? You know what I have to say? I would. Because of my route, that's the only route I know, I do think it's it's a good thing to go and do film studies. I feel like you could learn a lot on the job. If you're hungry enough to learn it, you could learn all the practical skills on the job. And I think that's very important. Like You don't have to pay for that stuff. You actually get paid to do that stuff. Mm -hmm. But to understand th film theory, to understand why people do certain things, why film is cut a certain way, uh, I think that's not something that you'll learn on the job that easily. Yeah. Right. So even like if you look at Quentin Tarantino, John Woo, people like that, their stories are always like, oh, I didn't go to film school. I went to films. Yeah. So they, they're not, they weren't making films either when they first started right. learning. They were learning the film narrative. Right. Right. And I think that's a very important thing. I think you and I both agree that people who are successful in the industry are the ones who actually take story to heart. Mm -hmm. They understand that you're trying to tell a story. You're not just trying to put Im beautiful images together and that's it. Right. So I think that's the one thing I, have, I would try to emphasize is like it's the story that you're trying to tell. If you have a good story, you have a good concept that trumps everything else. You can shoot it on your iPhone. If the story is right. compelling enough, 
it'll be fine. Yeah. And I think that, and especially nowadays with the YouTube generation where people are okay with subpar quality video and stuff like that. Those, those videos out there that are visually crappy or that are really successful is because it has a good narrative. Yeah. And I think that's a, that's probably the more important thing. If it comes to education in school is to learn about that. And I think film school definitely helped me with that. But, you know, going to a bunch of movies probably helps as well. <laughs> but be hungry. Whatever you study, wherever route you, uh, you go, don't be arrogant about what you know. Just remind yourself, you know nothing. You know shit. Right. So go out and learn more. And just be hungry and just do the best you can. And I think you'll be fine. Great. Great stuff. Thank you. What's the future hold? What have, what have you got on the horizon? Well, that's the reason why I tell people not to get into the industry because I still have no clue. <laughs> <laughs> I'm still living like a college student going on. Uh, if you weren't doing this, what would you be doing? If I wasn't doing this, what I would be, what would I be doing? <sighs> Selling shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note, okay, I do have one little feature that we're going to do. It's, we're going to close off each uh, episode here with the film word of the day. Film word of the day. Yeah. So I give you a film word or term and you tell me what it, what it means, what it's for. Okay. And today's word is Gary Coleman. Gary Coleman? Yeah. Gary Coleman. Uh, get me, I'll give you a hint. Uh, get me two Gary Coleman's off the truck, please. What? what he ha- do two Gary? <laughs> Can you, could you not have given me something easier? No, this is it. You're totally experienced. You've got tons of... Uh, Gary Coleman off the truck? Yeah, two of them. Two of them? Yeah. With a, uh, with a high sheet? roller. No. With a high roller. Was it, it's not a grilled cheese sandwich that you were delivering when no. you were... A Gary Coleman, it's a mini C-stand. Gary Coleman. Yeah. It's a mini C stand. <laughs> I picked that one up when I was shooting in Nashville and I loved it. Two so, Gary Coleman's. Yeah. And a couple of sandbags. Please. And a couple of sandbags. Yeah. So <laughs> when next time you're on set. Okay, cool, dude. Thank you. Thank you. Is this good? Oh, it was a lot of fun. All right. Hopefully you guys could uh, salvage that mess and come, I think I can come edit, up with something. I think I can edit about four minutes out of it. Four minutes? Good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the parts where we talk about the super PA. Right. <laughs> Hey, it was an absolute cool. pleasure. Thank, Thank you, you so much for having me. Thank you. So there you have it, my conversation with Lam Boyman, Mr. Berman Lamb. Uh, I hope you found some value in his story and experiences there. He definitely did not have a direct path from wanting to be in film and television to actually working in film and television. So I, I thought there were some pretty cool things that we talked about there, you know, about managing a creative team which is uh, something people don't think about. It's one thing to be creative for yourself. It's another thing to actually have to corral other creatives and and help bring out the best in them. And we discussed, you know, being a jack of all trade and a master of none. And I'd kind of like to know what you think out there. You know, how do you see yourself? Are you a jack of all trades? Uh, Or do you focus in on one specific skill set and just really try to excel at that? And how's that worked out for you? Okay, so it's, you know, I guess that's episode one in the can. All right. I feel not too bad about that. It's the first one. They'll get better. We'll find our voice here, right? So in the meantime, if there is a job out there that you want me to dive deeper into and you want to hear more about, or if you have specific questions for me or or Berman, my video twin, you just reach out to us. We are at videotwins.com. You can find all kinds of hacks and tools and tips and filmmaking resources there. We are on Twitter. And we are on Facebook. All right, so thanks for tuning in. And I look forward to bringing more shows to you. All right, and until next time, well, that's a wrap.